Can you put up the agenda, please? Yeah, uh, so we are recording and we are live, uh, just waiting for our attendees to populate the room. Wonderful. Excuse my mysterious lighting here. <laughs> I'm doing my best in the rental. <laughs> the beauty of blurred backgrounds. Yes. <laughs> Uh, I'm not seeing any attendees. Oh, looks like we have Anita Courier. There's Brian. Hey, Brian. <laughs> Excuse me, hey, Susan. <clears throat> Wrong pipe, not COVID. <laughs> oh, Robert Courier. That's. Gosh. Susanna Madeline, I'll defer to you on uh, agenda discussion and so forth. Yeah, I just want to make sure we have a quorum here. It doesn't look like we do yet. Still waiting on Karen, Mio. We have the mayor. One, two, three, four. Five. I guess we do have a quorum. Robert, is that you? That's me. Okay, just making sure. <laughs> <laughs> it's under my wife's name because she's got the computer. Okay. Hey, Mio. Hi. Welcome, welcome. I guess I'm going to just get us started. I know Karen will probably join yeah. momentarily. Is that okay? It is yes. 602. Yeah. Okay. Uh, calling uh, the meeting, uh, the January meeting of the oh Newberry Port Affordable Housing Trust to order. Welcome everybody again to this wonderful new year, uh, new group, new mayor. Uh, I'd like to introduce or welcome Sean, uh, Mayor Sean Reardon to the Housing Trust. We're happy to have you in the seat and uh, welcome your feedback, questions, and anything you'd like to say before we get started? <laughs> uh, no, just thank you for the nice welcome. I'm incredibly happy to be here. Uh, this is obviously a huge um, you know, issue, not only in New Reporter, but across the state. So I'm just excited to be part of these conversations and I look forward to working with everybody. Thank Great, you. Thank you. We, yeah, we appreciate and we thank you for making affordable housing one of your top priorities. So um, Welcome to this wonderful table. Um, let's go around just really quickly um, for mayor's um, um, education and just to let him get to know everybody a little bit. If you would just um, just say your name and kind of a, a little bit about your background and what brings you to the trust. Um, I'll, I'll start, <laughs> Suzanne Cameron. I'm a community development professional. I have uh, lots of experience in residential mortgage lending. Uh, residential real estate, um, advocacy, and, you know, all around love for this topic. <laughs> Madeline? Thanks, Suzanne, um, and welcome, everyone. Um, my name is Madeline Nash. I've been a member of the Housing Trust since it was formed in 2010. Uh, before that, I was a member of the Community Preservation Committee, and before that, I was a member of the Planning Board. And... Um, I have a background in affordable housing development, having worked for a couple of different community development corporations in Massachusetts. And right now I'm working for a nonprofit that lends to other nonprofits who are developing affordable housing around the state. So um, this is my passion um, and uh, I'm really excited to have some new members and to have the new mayor here, new energy and um, we have some exciting opportunities in front of us. And I'll pass it on to Karen Wiener. Hi, thanks, Madeline. Hi, everybody. Uh, good to see everyone. I, um, I work for a uh, nonprofit organization called CHAPA, Citizens Housing and Planning Association. 
I've been there for 30 plus years. I started when I was in diapers. And um, it is the statewide nonprofit affordable housing and community development organization. So we're a big membership organization. Folks like Madeline and Suzanne work for companies who are members of CHAPA. Um, we do a lot of work, policy work, and also some programmatic work. And um, what I hope I bring to the, the trust is that while I certainly don't know everything by any means that there is to know about affordable housing, I probably know somebody who knows the answer to whatever we're looking for just um, through my work. So um, hopefully that is helpful. Thank you, Karen. Brian? Good evening, <clears throat> Good evening everybody. My name is Brian Raish. Uh, I'm living in Newburyport since 2007. I sell residential real estate at William Ravis. Most of my work's in Newburyport, but I do a lot of pro bono help in Haverhill. I was on the board of Dinah's House, which is a drop-in center for women, mostly single women, help them with housing issues, sometimes rentals or evictions, those kinds of things. I'm a rector of a church in Reading, and I do um, a lot of fundraising for nonprofits. So how about Andrew? Maybe Mio? Sure. sure. My name is Mio Young, and I live in New Report. been here about uh, over 25 years. Um, my professional career was in international finance and also nonprofit finance locally. I worked at the uh, Coastal Educational Collaborative, Jeannie Geiger Crisis Center as the finance director. And um, I have been on the board of Roof Overhead Collaborative for eight years and um, also the board of the YWCA for six years. I'll be coming off of that board in April. Um, but I'm, I'll stay on their affordable housing committee, which I've been on for six years. That's it. And I just joined in November, December. Yes. Of this, yeah, last year. Yes. Thank you, Mio. Um, Sean, just so you know, um, Brian, Mio, and Robert, who we're about to hear from, are all brand new to the trust. So we'll turn it over to, to Robert. Can you hear me? Yes. Yep. Now you're muted again, Bob. Unmute. Unmute. All right, there, there we go. go. <laughs> um, my name is Bob Courier. Um, I've lived in Newburyport for about almost 50 years. I used to work for, I retired from um, Stratford Capital, which is a venture capital funded LLC that does only affordable housing. And I was in charge of the real estate division of that where I went out and found sites, schools, and as well as raw land, but primarily older buildings that we could do historical rehab on and then convert them into affordable housing. So I know the process and I am a strong advocate of affordable housing. And I try to talk to other communities around to figure out what they're doing to help us do what we should be doing. And um, communities like Lexington and Framingham really done some very interesting things, which I can get into later, but um, I've got a good background and I'm a strong advocate for affordable housing. Thank you, Bob. Thank you. Thank you all. This is, that's, we, I just, we have such a great, strong, talented group of people here. And I'm just really, really proud that um, we're starting the year off together. Um, I know uh, the Brown School is not next. I know Madeline just had a couple of top line um observations and and that she wanted to make uh, just again for the uh, um uh to benefit the new members and also uh the mayor so madeline did you want to go through just yeah. a couple of minutes of that yeah sure just briefly um you know because we have some new members and and uh and we're uh, our first meeting with uh mayor reardon um you know just briefly some background on the trust and and we are planning to go into this in more detail at our next meeting which we're hoping to have the first week of march but some of the things that the trust has worked on in the past is um creating and administering a down payment assistance program for first-time home buyers who are purchasing 
affordable housing units in Newburyport. So those are deed restricted units. And that's something that we have administered um, uh, with funding um, that we've applied for from the Community Preservation Committee. And um, that I think has been impactful. Uh, we also created an emergency rental relief program um, when COVID first hit the community and we um, have been working on that and uh, with Pettengill House. Uh, we, uh, in the last year, I think we worked with about 30 households and about 70 individuals included in those households were um, assisted through our rental relief program. And we are now gearing up to administer some new components to that program, again, working with Pettengill House. And we'll be talking about that some more at our next meeting. And we were uh, waiting to um, announce that to the um, Planning and Development Committee of the um, City Council. Um, we have done community education around the need for affordable housing, and we've worked on the creation of two housing production plans, and now we're gearing up to do that for a third housing production plan. And um, we created the Community Partners Grant uh, Program. Um, so we've been doing a number of different things, and we also provided some community education and advocacy around the Brown School. Um, so we have a draft um, strategic plan for the next year, for the year coming, uh, the year ahead of us. It's, um, it's a set of goals and action steps, and it's very much in draft form. It was sent out to you by Caitlin Sullivan from the planning department, just so that you could take a look at it, give you an idea of what we've been thinking about, and then we'll discuss it at our next meeting, which again, I hope is going to be the first week of March. And so I'm hoping we get input from you all. And um, that's really all I wanted to, to say to sort of set the stage a little bit before we got into our agenda. Madeline, will you want input before the meeting or? We'll take input oh, anytime. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> okay. I think before would be great just because what we're gonna do with that, um, the list of uh, goals that we have for the year is kind of um, delegate to um, them to um, by quarter. So we'll have first quarter goals, second quarter goals, et cetera. And so that we can just stay on track. So any anything you would like to add to that, it would be would be good uh, probably earlier, um, but any time is fine. Thank you, Madeline, for that. Um, OK, um, I'm going to turn it over to Andy Port uh, um, to talk about the Brown School. Sure, thank you. Um, let me just pull up a graphic on the screen just for reference. Um, actually, you know what, let me uh, use the pictometry view. Um, so just a visual there of the property, hopefully you can all see that. Um, so uh, we're all generally familiar with the property, but um, there's a couple of things uh, that I think are worth noting here. Um, obviously, with youth services out of the building, uh, at least I'll give you my two cents. I, I certainly think that housing is the most uh, appropriate and viable uh, adaptive for use of the building, uh, you know, the original uh, school building. Um, obviously there's an ongoing discussion uh, between the mayor and the council and others about um, what may happen with the gym uh, space. Um, I, but I, I think it's worth noting that and the expectation that some of the grounds be uh, maintained for the neighborhood. Um, these are all things that have been um, voted on or, or policy-wise been acted on in one form or another uh, by the council um, over time. And so um, there is some zoning over the property that was adopted relatively recently. Um, I think with the assumption that youth services would stay, um, there was a cap of 20 units put on that overlay district. So 20 units um, uh, at full build out uh, for the property, regardless of you know how things might be configured. Um, that I, for context, and some of the trust members already know this, um, but uh, there was some discussion about with nonprofits and with developers about whether that threshold would be viable for them, um, whether they might need, in fact, a few more units in order to make the project financially feasible. Um, so th that and, um, and the sort of overlapping neighborhood or community expectations of the property 
um, have been a source of you know debate over the last you know number of years. And part of the reason why we have not been able to move forward on um, on adaptive reuse of the property one way or the other, um, because those overlapping interests in some ways um, can conflict with each other. There's a uh, almost a mutual exclusiveness um, to it in the sense that there's um, only a limited amount of space on the property. So um, things like whether the gym is retained or not may impact, you know, what space is left over for, um, you know, park space or outdoor space beyond, you know, what needs to be maintained, um, you know, the, the basketball courts and playground, uh, what might be available for parking spaces for units and whatnot. So, um, uh, so that's just some of the general context here. We did do some feasibility studies over the years, uh, one looking at housing specifically, and I had a, a couple of the renderings to pull up if you want of the, the uh, schematic floor plans that they provided to us for uh, market rate, affordable, uh, artist live work units uh, or senior units. Um, again, just a schematic, you know, options for us to give us an idea of how uh, classrooms might be laid out, how many units might fit there, um, what sort of scale or, or size the units might be, and what amenities they might have, just to give us an idea of what might be viable. Um, we did, uh, we also had a feasibility study for use, focused on youth services, uh, and their, their potential um, to stay in the building and adapt and reuse the building or part of it. Um, so there's reports and schematic plans going with all that, and including some assessment of the structure, uh, utilities in the building and things like that that would have to be upgraded um, in one use or another. Um, so that's just generally some background. Uh, two other things I think are worth noting is that um, there was an RFP process done several years ago uh, where um, the city has solicited proposals uh, from nonprofits and developers. Uh, at the time, we got three proposals for adaptive reuse of the property. Uh, at that time, the assumption was, and we had uh, actually ended up selecting one of those uh, uh, proposals to work forward with, and then that uh, was abandoned before uh, that really moved ahead. Um, the three proposals were focused on uh, adaptive reuse of the primary building uh, for housing uh, with the use services to stay on the main floor and or the gym space uh, somewhere on the site essentially reconfigured. And so there were different uh, scenarios, you know, more or less shown in those, those developer plans. But in a way, it would have stayed on the site, um, and uh, there was generally an assumption that the gym space would be, you know, added to or modified somehow in the back to uh, accommodate their needs on site. Um, the context of why that was abandoned was generally that youth services of the director had expressed concern about um, that tightness of the site limiting their ability to have future expansion or needs uh, addressed. So, um, so that was the, the change, of course, at that point. And then, of course, um, uh, Mayor Holiday, when she was here, um, had been pursuing the, the Low Street property um, as a potential uh, location for youth services. Um, and obviously, since that whole effort uh, began, um, youth services has since left the building uh, because the heating system um, had failed. And it's a relatively old heating system that uh, is problematic to fix at this point, both costly and problematic to find the parts for. Um, so uh, the only other thing I think is worth noting, uh, and I'm happy to answer any other questions and uh, assist, but um, definitely happy to help with uh, adaptive reuse of the property, regardless of what uh, the mayor and the council decide to do with it, uh, regardless of what parameters are set up. Um, but definitely think housing is uh, is a strong need, as, as the mayor and um, you know other members here have said, uh, it is a strong need the community has. It's the only municipal property we have that's available for this purpose, uh, you know, right now in any you know substantial way in the foreseeable future. Um, so there's uh, clearly one of the assets we have to make affordable housing uh, would be this property. Um, and so how, what the parameters are that we set up are obviously going to be important uh, going forward. But uh, one other thing I did think was important to note uh, for those of you, just as a reminder for some of you, is uh, we do have about $230,000 or so uh, from a state grant program. Um, I'm dealing with some, some paperwork to adjust the use of those funds from design services uh, for the housing, which was the original assumption. And by the way, these funds can only be used for the housing, uh, not, for the, not for any other municipal use, say, on the property or other use. Um, the idea was to lower the bar, the cost to create housing, um, and in this case, you know, affordable housing as well. Um, so uh, those are housing choice uh, grant funds. And so um, with those funds, we had done some um, phase one and phase two assessment of the property just to know what our, uh, you know, hazmat environmental issues were on the site. Um, so we did get some reporting on that. Um, and so uh, with the remaining funds, I have talked with the mayor, I've talked with the two uh, ward counselors, both the ward one and ward two, ward two counselors. Um, I actually uh, had spoken also to former ward two counselor Jared Argumen earlier today uh, about it. And, you know, generally speaking, there seems to be, you know, consensus at this point on this, but um, we're trying to basically uh, in a relatively short time frame at this point, uh, still make use of those funds. And the original concern I had, uh, although I was uh, agreeing that we should apply for the grant and we got it. Um, my concern was that if we did not, as a community, um, nail down some specifics about the adaptive reuse that, that there was consensus over that we could actually move forward with, 
it would be hard to spend those funds as originally proposed in the grant, which was to have a, an architect or design team uh, do design services for us that would lower the cost, you know, for, for creating those housing units. Um, that becomes difficult if you don't know exactly what the parameters are for the building because room layouts, uh, utility runs and things like that might be, you know, very different. So you don't want to throw money away. And so um, in essence, what I have talked to, uh, to folks here about is to do two things specifically, um, you know, generally in a relatively short time, time frame we still have at this point is um, to try to do two things. And I, again, open up to, uh, to suggestions, but recognizing that the sort of constraints we have. We want to do something that will lower uh, the cost for the city, regardless of use in the property, but certainly here for housing um, uh, under this grant program and um, and and uh, not do something that's going to be ripped out later on. Uh, so the ideas that we had are essentially were to remove the oil tank uh, that's underground, um, which no one would be using on a go forward basis, remove a, a potential environmental liability, even though there, there wasn't a sense that soils were contaminated. Um, it is a, a, an issue that uh, we can resolve. Uh, and take away any concern for a nonprofit or developer we may partner with on the, the housing side. Um, so that was one item that will, uh, and I'm talking with Mike Bartlett, the facilities manager about uh, about that. Um, uh, and he's got a proposal from a, uh, consult, a contractor for that. Um, the other piece was uh, restoration of the windows. Essentially what is what you're seeing on the image is the two shorter sides of the building, the school, the school building, uh, would be to renovate uh, those uh, older historic windows. Um, you know, long story short, in the overlay district for the Brown School, there's an assumption in that overlay district that the windows be preserved. Um, I suspect that that will be, still be something that is raised as a uh, community concern in one way or another. Uh, whether it's a large concern or a small concern, I can't say. Um, but I imagine that the Preservation Trust, uh, you know, and a few others may have concern that the, the windows be preserved, the building be preserved in some format uh, to the best of our ability. So um, with that in mind and recognizing that windows uh, on the building are something that would need some work, um, in talking with the so-called window woman in Amesbury, um, we got a quote for uh, what it essentially would, would take to do the 29 or so windows on the two shorter sides um, and recognizing that we can't, unfortunately, with the available funds, do all the windows in the building. That, that, that quote was too high. Um, we, we might be able to do those two shorter sides of the building. And so that has some, some benefits. One is uh, we know that the windows would have, you know, window work would have to be done on these building, on this building. Um, we'd be saving uh, the future you know, partner of ours, whether it's ourselves, the housing authority, a nonprofit, a developer. We'd be reducing the cost you know, for that hurdle to get to the, uh, the housing units, in this case, affordable um, to the best of our ability here in the trust perspective. Um, and um, and we're, we're addressing the historic aspect uh, of those windows. And the neighborhood itself hasn't had a whole lot of or seen a whole lot of improvement to that property you know, in recent years because it hasn't been you know, uh, clear which path we're taking. And so there's been sort of hesitation about investing in the property significantly. Um, but this is something that would actually be a tangible, visible result, let's say, for at least a portion of the, the neighbors there uh, in relatively short term time frame, because we know how long it takes to get things uh, mobilization, if you will, of a project, um, given that we have to start from where we are today and get to say zoning changes, maybe um, disposition of the property, you know, and including terms for what that would be, how many units, you know, and so forth. Um, all that stuff takes time, getting a developer proposal in here, finding something we, you know, that the city uh, thinks is the appropriate uh, scheme, assuming that's where we go, um, and then getting them under construction, that can take some time. So again, uh, one thing, one ancillary benefit of doing that is also here that the residents next door might actually see some improvements being done to the property um, that are aesthetically maybe appealing. Um, so, you know, I open up to discussion and questions and, you know, and, and how we can be of assistance. Uh, Caitlin, unfortunately, isn't here this evening, but um, how we can be of assistance, obviously, to the mayor, the council and the trust. Um, but I think there's definitely a great opportunity for partnership here to create uh, housing here and specifically affordable housing uh, with the Brown School. I think the, the real uh, tough part, which has always been um, the uh, conversation point, has been what are those parameters? Um, you know, whether or not there's any municipal use on the property in or otherwise, which seems to be, I, I think, sort of moving on as a, a question here, um, although I'll defer to the, the officials who have to make those calls, um, and, um, and what parameters to set for the housing side. You know, there's a 20-unit cap, so does that need to be uh, revised in some way? Andrew, uh, oh, I just sorry, had a... Sorry. Go ahead, Mia. Yeah. Um, just a question. Is there a time limit on the state funds? Yeah, that's part of the constraint. Um, so we're now down down to uh, June 30th of this year. Um, and that's part of the reason for trying to do some things that we know are manageable within that time frame. Um, mm -hmm. I had talked with uh, Councilor Z, uh, the Ward 1 Councilor across the street, um, and trying to work with the, the two applicable Ward Councilors as we try to do in general. Um, uh, you know, his preference in general seemed to be working on the hazmat materials that might be on the property. Um, the primary concern, I think, with that is that it's, uh, it's not clear what the end point with that would be. 
Uh, we'd only be doing part of the hazmat costs, you know, remediation of the building. Um, we, uh, we don't know if we'd be chasing costs because sometimes we might discover some more and have to do a change order and then, you know, not have enough funds and potentially need to, uh, you know, request a transfer from the council to finish that work. So it, it makes more sense, I guess, in general, considering a bunch of different parameters that we try to do something that we know is achievable in that time frame. Um, having discussed with the grant uh, administrators, the, the fact that they won't be able to give us necessarily an extension uh, on that time frame. Andy, um, is is it possible in this in its pre-development state and because the building is vacant can we utilize funds for lighting and safety perhaps cameras i know there was some concern about rocks going through the windows or what have you is there any um, issue around safety there and is it lit yeah, that's a great point. Um, I do think that, and again, I'll defer to Mike Bartlett and Andy Egmont and those folks who were there who have been there more frequently and dealt with these issues uh, more directly. But um, window, you know, smashing, if you will, or showing rocks or whatnot has definitely been an issue. And the facilities manager has certainly noted that um, on a number of occasions when we've walked through the building with folks to, to walk through the options and the issues uh, for various reasons, uh, like I just summarized. Uh, but um, I definitely think that's an issue. I think uh, certainly, and again, if we're going to be restoring windows, we want to make sure that those are protected. We had talked, by the way, in the scope of uh, adding storm windows, uh, you know, to the outside, both while they're doing the work and also um, as a sort of more an extra sort of uh, insulative you know, measure as well. Um, so, um, yeah, there is an issue there with that. Um, and lighting, certainly, I think, generally speaking, the, the state's guidance to us on shifting those funds from design to construction was it's all very consistent with the original purposes. Um, but it has to be, generally speaking, you know, um, ensuring the future use for housing or encouraging that in some way. So here, I think an argument certainly could be made that um, some additional lighting or, or anything to sort of secure the property uh, would make sure that this property is not further to deteriorate uh, while we're trying to create the housing. And that was um, one of the reasons for looking toward the, the windows. Um, Mike, by the way, I should also mention a smaller allocation or discussion about um, cost for uh, roof patching, because that has been uh, the building envelope, obviously, being the key feature here. Um, we're trying to take care of. Uh, that has been a, another cost. So yes, that's definitely an option. I guess I'd have to work with uh, some other city officials on what would be appropriate and where the city electrician, um, Mike Bartlett, the facilities manager, and, and perhaps the ward council and others just to kind of get some thoughts on that. But um, that certainly could be helpful here. And, um, you know, as long as we're able to work out the numbers that could be done with those funds um, generally, or some other source of funds if that's uh, needed for some reason. And funds have to be committed or spent by June 30th. Uh, we have to have spent those funds essentially. Actually so spent. it's that, wow. that's part of that's part of <laughs> that's the, yeah, that's yeah. part of the problem. So it, it's not one of those things where I can say let's just encumber them by June 30. Um, you know, mm -hmm. I tried to to work out um, you know, what we could do in that time frame. And, and again, it, as I mentioned to Mayor Holiday when she was in office, um, we had we were already starting with at the beginning of the grant program a very tight time frame given the lack of clarity on the um, you know, some of the specificity of the future adaptive reuse of the property. Um, you know, there was different community sentiments expressed in different meetings and uh, in different forums about what that what that should be. Um, obviously, NYS being uh, one focal point for that, um, and the gym being you know perhaps another here. Um, and um, so, yeah, that's that's one of my concerns is just at least at a bare minimum making sure we've used those funds, we've put them into something that we are not throwing away at the end of the day, or wouldn't have to rip out. You know, regardless of what the future use is, um, I certainly hear the expectation being that it's housing. Um, so again, that's why we, we sort of came to those two things and, um, you know, short of anything, uh, miraculous happening in the next couple of days, I think we really need to get going on those with the, uh, the vendors, if you will, uh, just to make sure we're staying in time, right? Mainly the windows, which are the work that would take time. So. And, and they don't um, have to be installed, right? You, you could prepay or the work could be ongoing. Uh, well, actually, they, I, I had actually talked with uh, with the window woman again. This, there's other consultants who can do it, but I wanted to get uh, a proposal from a consultant we know uh, that's been reputable, you know, experience with, um, and, um, and and get some ideas of what the costs were. Um, yeah, the the based on her time frame, they would be able to accomplish all that work okay. prior to June 30, and so we would wow. obviously. Uh, this is a reimbursement grant, by the way. So the city spends the funds. Um, gets the funds reimbursed into that account essentially, um, but that is we'd have to have those, that work done by then. It wouldn't be one of those you know sign a contract, pay them up front, and do later. Generally yeah. speaking, we we'll do that anyway um, because we might be you know chasing the consultant or contractor later on. So. Andy, um, I think the um, underground storage tank removal makes a ton of sense. Um, the window replacement, I think you're saying. Uh, I'm, my only concern is if the 
developer who ends up redeveloping the site um, is going after historic tax credits. Mm -hmm. You would want to have the right kind of window installed. Um, so yeah, sorry, just to be clear, this isn't replacement windows. This would be to restore the windows. To restore yeah. existing window. Right, right. So it, it, I actually was talking with Councilor Agamemnon today, or a former Councilor Agamemnon today. That was one of the points that he was reminding me of as well. Uh, you know, it's, it, you know, it's in context here, but um, that those tax credits may be available as long as we're not. Um, I'm just, you know, I guess my concern then uh, is that we have very high energy standards, uh, especially for affordable housing, um, and it's so it's not only taking into consideration restoring as is but also you know making the building as energy efficient as possible it's mm -hmm. just windows is a big thing uh especially with a historic preservation project and i'm just a little concerned that you know you, you were saying and we all understand you don't want to do something that then we has to be redone mm -hmm. and so it's sort of taking into consideration you know neighborhood safety uh, historic preservation and energy efficiency. It's a lot. Uh, and Windows tends to be one of those very tricky and important details in a, in a housing project like this. Mm -hmm. So I just caution you <laughs> that you take all of that into consideration. Yep. No, definitely have, uh, you know, the, the again, with a shorter time frame, I, I certainly recognize and then, you know, others may feel, all right, you know, those windows could be replaced. Uh, um, but I don't think that that's likely to be something that would be immediately, um, you know, palatable that, we, you know, I, I think we sort of meet with some opposition if we were to propose to say replace those windows right now with replacement windows, uh, recognizing that they could, uh, you know, based on our view of the windows, be restored, obviously, uh, that would improve the um, the ceilings, obviously, on the edges of the windows. Um, they're in relatively good condition, you know, uh, for, uh, in a number of cases, some of them have been damaged, of course, as Suzanne mentioned. Um, and, um, but, um, but the, the idea is also that there would be storm windows, um, you know, on the outside, which would add a little bit to that, um, um, you know, insulation value, or at least uh, the air uh, passage stuff. Um, it understood, you know, they're all valid concerns here, I guess, but um, we're sort of under some tight parameters here to do something that's viable within the, these, you know, uh, overlapping constraints. And um, I do think generally speaking that's been taken into account, which is that um, the windows would be restored. Uh, it wouldn't, it would remain, you know, eligible for those tax credits. Um, and, um, you know, um, it's something that would lower the bar for or cost later on uh, for someone with the building. Presumably they would not want to replace those windows. Uh, they would be happy with the fact that we'd restore them and then they would focus on say the back windows uh, or, or even the front windows, the, the more modern ones um, in the infill area <clears throat> that uh, might need to be uh, improved for some reason. Any other comments, questions for Andy? I have a comment. Um, yeah. If we assume that affordable housing for elderly people is the objective of that building, what's wrong with just going with that objective? And if we put an RFP out and we get solicitations from different developers that will do that project, they will want to do about probably 40 to 50 units total to make it financially, financeability. It's, it's very important. And then they will worry about fixing the windows to the proper historical standards in today's current rules with the federal government, considering the LED, <coughs> the energy's requirements. That way, the building can be either sold or whatever, so that somebody can really get to work on this project. We need affordable housing for elderly people. That's the only way to do this. Yeah, Bob, I, I, at least from my perspective, I agree with that, you know, in large part, but um, again, without having set some of the parameters or having internal consensus on the city side as to what those parameters are, it becomes hard to go out with an RFP, uh, you know, properly on that. So again, we're back to time constraints here, and, and it doesn't seem that that will necessarily align here. Uh, we certainly could pass that work on to the uh, developer or nonprofit that we might partner with. But the question then, we're back to the similar question as well. What do we spend those funds on right now? What could be achieved in that time frame that wouldn't necessarily be thrown away uh, by whatever the uses or adaptive uh, work is that's there in the future? Uh, and I'm open to you know suggestions as to how we could do that in that compacted time frame. But um, but um, you know that it's just these overlapping considerations, and we just haven't had that clarity 
Uh, and it sounds like there may be some needs to be some tweaking, say, to the bill out allowance uh, for that, like you said. But the advice from a developer to you, what to do with that several hundred thousand dollars may be very well intended and it can parlay with what they're trying to do with the project. And, you know, you get some good advice from these people. I think we should solicit some advice. And if the mayor wants to go ahead and develop affordable housing in Newburyport, it's a classic approach to doing it. Right, Mayor? Yes. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> well, Andy, does that make... Andy, does that make sense though to, I mean, even just seek, seek some advice from a developer? I mean, it does, obviously doesn't have to be the one that we'll eventually partner with, but like just to see, you know, what, you know, they might have an idea that, that we're not thinking of. I don't know. I'm just asking. Yeah. Um, well, all I can tell you is if um, we can certainly look for more feedback at this point, but the, the reality is that having discussed various different options that we have, uh, you know, at our disposal at this point, given that the time frame of the grant and so forth, um, there is nothing that, that, you know, really has come up that would be viable at this point. You know, I had looked originally, I thought, well, you know, we know the elevators, uh, you know, uh, inadequate, we'd have to replace the elevator. So maybe the design services are spent on the elevator work. Uh, we could do, you know, all, some design work associated with the units, you know, to get that going, get that base going. But um, it became obvious we weren't able to be able to close the loop on some of these parameters, which, um, you know, we could get, you know, thoughts from developers and nonprofits on what work would be appropriate. But and remember that, you know, each day or week or month, you know, that goes on as we get sort of that feedback, we're running out of time to actually do work with those funds. And uh, I don't have the sense having looked at all the different billing, you know, elements, if you will, um, as sense of, of any other work that we could possibly do that wouldn't necessarily be undone by someone else later on. All the utility, the building is structurally fine, you know, it's generally, but um, it's a bit like a rock, but the, uh, all the utilities in the building would have to be replaced. Um, you know, windows, obviously, like I've talked about, no work would have to be done. It's not clear what's happening exactly with the gym space or the, you know, interstitial space, as I call it, you know, there in between. So without some of those parameters being set, it becomes hard to um, see that us or them necessarily picking something to do that won't necessarily be, um, you know, revised by someone else down the road. Um, so, yeah, you know, it's, uh... Andy, given, um, give us an idea of if we, I mean, clearly the city council has an ad hoc, ad hoc um, committee that's being um, constituted right now. Um, and the, under the best circumstances, if we hold everyone's feet to the fire, how long do you think it would take to get to RFP? Like what, in terms of timeline, how, how soon can we get to that process? I mean, we certainly by, I mean, if we were really fast for a feet to the fire, like you say, I mean, we could by <laughs> end of spring, you know, summertime, have an RFP out in the street, you know, be looking for proposals from nonprofits and developers. Um, but I think that primarily comes back to the discussions the council would have to have to, uh, you know, and I think in the context of some of you are familiar with, look at the Brown School Overlay District or any other types of provisions in zoning because that is one primary limitation right now is the cap of 20 units. Uh, and, and again, I'm not you know uh, taking issue with that, but it certainly has been expressed to us um, from nonprofits and developers that that number is not realistic uh, given the amount of expenditure that would have to be done on this building to, to renovate it uh, and create those units. And, um, and, and still we need to have some clarity with respect to the gym space and how that may directly or indirectly uh, impact what site available space is available or whether or not any addition or modification might be done to the Brown School building uh, relation to the housing. So um, if we could nail down those specifics, you know, in very short order, uh, you know, in a couple months, it would be, you know, relatively yeah. straightforward to prepare an RFP and get it out in the street at that point. Um, but largely that's before the council, I think, at this point uh, yeah. in, in relation with the mayor. So. Can I ask, um, maybe it's a question for you, Mayor, or, or for Andy. How much of a priority is this? I mean, you know, I know there's lots of things the city has to to um, to juggle. How much of a priority is this compared to maybe other issues that are on the table in terms of getting an overlay district, you know, maybe um, amended to make it more financially feasible? I'll let Andy answer, but I'll just say, I mean, I, I think it is a priority. I think, you know, especially with, you know, coming out of budget and finance, knowing that we're going to move forward. It looks like uh, on, on January 31st with the purchase of 57 Low Street, uh, you know, part of that was looking at the viability of the gym. So, I mean, those things are going to happen here in the next couple of months where, um, you know, I think that will give us a path to move forward on, you know, other uses for, for the Brown School. And as Suzanne mentioned, you know, uh, you know, I, I met with President uh, Heather Shan today and talking about the ad hoc. So, I, you know, 
I think we're moving in the right direction, but I mean, I, I think, you know, there's a couple more dominoes that have to fall first, especially particularly around, you know, what's going to happen with the gym. I mean, I think if we have a, you know, if the council has a better idea of, of what the costs would be and, you know, then talking about the benefits possibly of, of retaining the gym, I, th I think they need some, some solid answers there, but then we can move forward with, you know, you know, dealing with the Brown school part. Andy, does that sound about right or? Yeah, I would agree with the mayor on that. And I would say just, you know, I, again, having been here for a couple of years, the, uh, you know, there has been, I want to say stagnation, but there hasn't been uh, ability to move forward on some of these particulars with the Brown School property or building. Um, and I think we have an opportunity now, you know, to do that. And I certainly, I think as a, a land use planning matter, um, you know, it's a priority project for the, for the Office of Planning and Development, for the city, you know, various city entities. Uh, the planning board, you know, uh, you know, some of the members there are obviously interested in the housing aspect of this. Um, we have obviously advocates on the housing trust and others who have come to many numerous meetings. We have a neighborhood who obviously wants to see something done to clean up this property and, you know, make a, a, viable, a viable adaptive reuse of it. Um, so um, it definitely seems like a priority project in terms of city property. Uh, and, um, and I would also say, frankly, from the um, although the affordable housing is the primary need and the primary focus we should all be having. Um, we also have the, the question of 40B and what units are being added to our subsidized housing inventory uh, and the, the so-called safe harbor status that the community has or may be able to you know, maintain. So um, one thing to keep in mind is that while we may have a safe harbor you know, during a two-year period, uh, well, the Minko project is expected to be approved in the coming weeks um, from, say, uh, you know, a threatened 40B we may not think is appropriate in your report for various reasons, um, that uh, that is only a two-year freeze, if you will, the way that the process works in some. So as a consequence, it becomes very important for us to, um, it, not just the affordable units themselves, but if we want to maintain the city's, um, you know, protected status from projects that may not be appropriate uh, for various reasons, um, it would be important to make sure that we're producing additional units, whether by uh, you know the zoning, the permitting, uh, or development itself, um, to make sure that we keep doing that. Because otherwise, uh, we're not making any progress in that second year when it when it transitions to the third. We're out of that safe harbor status as well. So again, this property is is the primary resource we have as a city right now to create those units, um, aside from say additional funds from the, from the trust or the CPC, for instance. Yeah, I mean, this has been, I mean, we really do owe it to the, the, to the neighborhood. We, we desperately need the units um, in the city as the housing costs continue to soar. Um, people just have nowhere to go. And it's, it's really, it's just time. And so I'd really love to see this, you know, uh, from, you know, uh, from the city council making this a, you know, number one priority and just like give them a time, like a deadline almost and say, we need to come to consensus by this date so we can be shovel ready by X, you know, or something. Uh, but it's time to push here. Sorry. <laughs> um, Agreed. <laughs> for what it's worth. <laughs> And then, you know, this office obviously will continue to assist. I mean, there's a little bit of back and forth between the mayor's office and council's office over the years um, about some of the particulars and even individual counselors about the particulars. Um, but I think we have, you know, uh, it seems like there's a lot of enthusiasm and interest on the part of the counselors, uh, you know, this term to, to focus on the Brown School, uh, you know, and as the mayor said, you know, this is, um, you know, a priority area for us to focus on. Um, and, uh, and, you know, we certainly have an opportunity here. So I, like you said, I think if we can close some loops with the council on some of these parameters and, and um, issues that have been raised about, you know, say the gym or the zoning constraints that may or may not work uh, for the partners we may work with, um, then it becomes viable for us to get an RFP out the street to actually, you know, bring that to fruition. And um, we've seen other projects in other communities where schools have been adaptively re reused, including, as I mentioned at the, the, uh, the building walkthrough, a Brown school in the city of Peabody um, <laughs> that, uh, that had an addition on the back, but, um, but very comparable, I guess, in terms of the original building work. Um, you know, we have an opportunity here. And I, I think that a lot of that rests with trying to work with the counselors on something that is palatable and, and workable from their perspective. Yes. Yeah. And the theme of giving up a little and getting a lot, we all have to be willing that, and know that we're not going to get everything we want, but we need to be willing to get to closure here. Yeah, I just wanted to say that I hope that the trust has an opportunity to serve if a task force or a subcommittee is formed uh, to uh, pursue the redevelopment that the um, housing trust is able to have a representative on that. Yeah, I, I can just tell you with my conversations with uh, Council President Shan that that was the idea was to have two members of the Affordable Housing Trust on that ad hoc, so. Wonderful, thank you so much. Mayor, she will appoint the two members, is that correct? 
That's my understanding. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you. Either that or she was going to consult with the chairs. So, I mean, I think that's the direction we're going in. Wonderful. Great. I just have a, a, a quick, quick question for Andrew. Um, who um, makes the final decision on um, how we'll spend that money? And is there any way to revisit the toxic material removal, maybe focus on a certain area? Um, yeah. Yeah, that's a great questions. Um, ultimately speaking, it's it's up to the mayor. Um, but as okay. I outlined to the mayor, because again, you know, in short order, I, I have had to work with a new mayor transitioning to, you know, sort of a, a lot of background, trying to figure out what can we do in six months without, you know, uh, and, and sort of hit the ground running. Um, so it is ultimately speaking the mayor's call. Um, what I have tried to do is present what I think are viable options for us. Uh, you know, in the time frame and the constraints that we have. And that's why I presented these two things. Um, the, the hazmat removal, we certainly could look to do that. However, we only got, you know, a, basically a, a ballpark estimate from the consultants. And as we certainly have experienced over the years with various capital projects, like the wastewater treatment uh, facility revetment, uh, you know, rail trail project, um, the garage project, we had some costs for asbestos, you know, removal, and it was you know, basically backfilled soil from, you know, historic use of the site. Um, we encounter materials and we find that it's not the original assessment of the cost, but actually additional costs that come along with that as we chase, you know, the issue. So it, it, that is not as quantifiable. And as I talked about with uh, former Councilor Agerman, you know, earlier today, um, we, we know from experience with some of these projects, and, and certainly some of you have had experience with these as well, you know, it, that is harder to know that we will stay within budget uh, at this point. And we certainly are not going to cover, uh, you know, all that that has that we're only becoming a, a fraction or percentage of it. So um, it doesn't seem wise to me to spend the monies on that when we're not sure we complete anything. We're not even sure we can complete a coherent area without, you know, running into a problem. Um, and, and we're certainly not going to clean up the property uh, for everybody, you know, there. They, there's a lot more, uh, you know, potential liability and a baggage that may come from going that route and trying to do that in a relatively short order. Thank let's, you. Let's come back to that. Um next meeting and see where we are on um, that decision. Um, we'd love an update if possible. Yeah, sure. And I, I'm sorry, just uh, you know, to be frank, and I, again, I'll defer to the mayor entirely on this, but um, be, literally every day counts on this. So uh, that was yeah. part of the reason why you know, my hope was working uh, with the mayor and, and talking, having talked to the councilors that we'd be able to just get going on these contracts right away. Because um, like I said, it's it, literally waiting between committee meetings uh, you know, every couple of weeks just wouldn't provide sufficient time to even, you know, right. to do the tank removal might be feasible, but things like the window work or, or anything else that someone might want to throw on the table, um, depending on what that is, if there's some other idea that might be viable, um, even that getting that mobilized may be an issue, uh, given where we are right now. Um, so again, I just trying to keep that in mind, I guess. Yeah, I vote for tank windows <laughs> and lighting <laughs> and safety. We want safety around that building. <laughs> yeah, I, I will talk with uh, Mike Barlin, the uh, city electrician, about the lighting side of it, because I think, frankly, that goes hand in hand, not only with the, the site safety, but uh, in general. But um, we're, if we're going to restore windows and, and try to make sure adaptive reuse of that property and, and not any further deterioration, we also have to make sure there's no vandalism. So exactly. Um, yeah. OK, um, so I'm going to move us along. We're, we're um, I'm getting off of my promise to you of <laughs> one hour meetings here. Andy, did you have something else in inclusionary zoning? Um, I guess just a comment on that. I mean, Caitlin might have wanted to comment if she was here. Generally speaking, we had talked a little bit internally, and I don't know, uh, I'm not privy to all the conversations you've had uh, in, in recent months only because I, there were some meetings where I had conflicts um, or I had to attend another meeting. So, um, But I knew there's been this, some discussion perhaps amongst the trust and, uh, and for us ourselves internally about uh, whether or not, for instance, the six unit uh, threshold mm -hmm. that's in the inclusionary ordinance, whether we'd, or not we'd want to tweak that or look to have um, an adjustment for financial contribution for projects that are smaller than six units. Um, but, you know, uh, looking to where that ordinance has or has not been used, you know, since it's, uh, you know, amendment or adoption, um, looking to see if there's anything else we can do to bolster uh, what we get out of the inclusionary ordinance. Um, and of course, there's other areas where we can, we can leverage um, inclusionary units, whether it's, you know, forgetting the inclusionary ordinance itself, that one section of the ordinance, there are other places where we can see that happen, the 40 yard district or um, whatever the parameters are, you know, set or reset for Waterfront West. There are other areas where we can create affordable units uh, with an inclusionary, you know, component. So um, I guess I would defer large part to what the inputs of the, the housing trust members are here uh, and the mayor, you know, on, on if you have any thoughts on, on what you'd like to see there. Caitlin and I are happy to work on, you know, revisions and so forth. Um, but I think the main thing that I've heard uh, mentioned was the question of whether or not we could get an additional financial contribution 
for affordable units the city may need to do, um, you know, uh, with smaller contributions, say, you know, whether it's $50,000 because someone's doing a, a three unit or four unit project or whatnot. There was a four unit project proposed on State Street. Uh, the, there was question raised about whether or not any uh, units would be created or one unit might be created out of the four there for affordable purposes because it's again it's below the six unit threshold um, or whether or not a project of that size could at least contribute some dollar amount you know $150,000 $100,000 given the market rate value of, of housing in Newburyport right now um, you know that might not be necessarily unreasonable whatever that number is so um, those are things that I've heard um, discussed and you know open up to you if you have suggestions for us you want us to look to um, as we're always looking to update codes that might be in ways that might be beneficial. Karen, is, do you want to insert your multifamily? Okay, go ahead. Yeah, so um, sort of in that whole zoning discussion, I mean, there's the 40R district, there's there's inclusionary zoning. Um, is the planning office working on or, or, or aware, I'm sure you're aware, but you know, the, um, to back up for a moment, sorry, in the economic development bill that was passed by the state last year, it said that communities with an MBTA stop had to zone for multifamily dwellings within half a mile. And there's all these complicated, you know, formulas around it. But I didn't know how much our 40R district already encompasses that or how much we want to look at that. And I know the regs just came out, you know, more specific about how to do that. And there's not a requirement for affordable within that, but I thought it'd be great if, if we have to do another district, I don't know, again, maybe it's all 40R, but <laughs> if it's not, to um, see how we could could apply inclusionary or better there. Yeah, uh, well, again, I guess my comment on that or, or uh, just initial thoughts are, I have looked at the guidance, this is the MBTA community's guidance um, coming out of the housing choice legislation. Um, and uh, in, in summary, what it says right now, it, the Department of Housing and Community Development has taken the um, authority they were granted by the legislature to determine what is a reasonable, uh, you know, uh, you know, residential smart growth district around the, these uh, MBTA stations. They have determined that, in essence, our 40 hour district, which originally, as you see on this map here, the original calculation, you know, following some state guidelines as to how that's done, um, assumed a roughly 500, 540 unit uh, build out in the district. Now this is, you know, in some ways optimistic because it assumes redevelopment of existing uh, properties that are, have uses on them where, you know, say you've got the, the hardware store and, uh, and so forth on the, the sub district B area, uh, as you see there. So um, there's the assumption that the, I think as you can tell right now, the low hanging fruit of properties have, has already been pursued by Minko um, the MBTA site, the, uh, the ambulance site, you know, with one and three Boston way and now the Haley site that's, uh, you know, in permitting right now, those, I, those I would describe as possibly low hanging fruit, mainly because there weren't really strong viable uses on the property previously, uh, or ones that were very active per se. Um, and so, uh, and there were already, there was already log, lots of discussion about redevelopment, uh, for those properties. So, um, so I think that, it, you know, there'll be continued work on, you know, redevelopment potential with those other properties, but it may come a little slower and a little bit more, you know, complicated than say the ones that we've seen thus far, the three we've seen thus far, but in essence, they've said that the district of the, the total build out would have to more than double. So I think it's just under 1300 units. They would expect us to create in this district. Um, well, the area of the district is literally like point something under the 50 acre requirement um, that they had. So we're, we're very close to that. We could easily amend it, you know, to add some area. Um, uh, I guess I would say that the unit count, it seems to be of more concern and, and, and potentially problematic for Newburyport, uh, unless you plan on having skyscrapers or uh, substantially redeveloping the business park or Back Bay neighborhood. Um, you know, I have talked with uh, uh, folks like Rick Tainter on the planning board about you know, how, how uh, sort of an, an irregularly, you know, designed district may satisfy some of these requirements, but um, there's different ways of, of cutting that. But I guess the first thing I would say is that we have to have a hearing as a community um, and I'll, I'll be coordinating more with the mayor and the council president and others on this, but um, the community has to hold a hearing before May, uh, basically uh, summarizing, you know, what, what the situation is here, uh, you know, and providing essentially feedback to the state. Um, from that process as to any concerns we have and, and you know, what we might be uh, able to do here. It seems to me that initial feedback that I would be giving to uh, the HCD and that the community I assume would be doing a, a, as an entity in a larger uh, body, you know, multiple city officials, 
uh, collectively through that hearing process in the coming weeks or months. Uh, I, I imagine that's going to be to DHCD that that may be a little aggressive and that uh, what they're looking for may, it may need to be, um, you know, down, you know, pared down a bit in terms of number of unit count or something like that. Um, and I think that's pretty, my sense is that's pretty consistent with what they're going to hear from other communities uh, in the region or in the Commonwealth. Um, you know, just in context, um, the, uh, the expectation there for build out and what can be done. Um, there is a, a uh, that's partly why they allowed a comment period. That's partly why they have a delayed it, you know, impact on our ability to apply for state grants um, uh, so they can figure out what they're doing there. But my sense is that number will be tailored back in some way uh, before the guidelines are finalized. Um, and I think this is an opportunity for each community to weigh in. And it seems to me that we need to weigh in, at least in part, that um, that's very aggressive unless we're really substantially increasing the size of the district. Um, and, and I'm not sure that that's palatable to the, to the council. This, this district, you know, uh, you know, had some hesitation, at least from a few councillors when at the time it was adopted. So. so two questions about that. And thank you. That was very, very helpful, um, Andy. So one, I guess, is from my perspective and from this meeting, you know, the Affordable Housing Trust, I just want to make sure that whatever it's zoned for, whatever number it is, that we are able to maximize affordable housing there. And certainly if it's expanding the 40R district, I forget if that's 25 or 30 percent, but that's more than if it's just inclusionary zoning. So, so I would, you know, and plus the city gets benefits from that. But anyway, however it works, I would want to advocate for that amount of affordable housing in in the sure. district. Sure. Um, and just to be clear, right now the requirement is we had the bare minimum we had to do of 20 percent. Uh, we specifically chose at the time we brought this forward to draft it, and it's adopted with a 25 percent requirement. That and that's, I tried. We wanted to make sure. Uh, <laughs> One, we get additional units out of that, the additional 5%, but two, we also get credit for all those, if there's a rental project for all those units on the SHI. Uh, and so that's was specifically why we did that. So as of right now, and I wouldn't necessarily expect that to change in the district, um, it's 25% of those units that would be have to be affordable. Okay, and then my second question is, I understand that um, communities that are contiguous have to plan as well. So are we in talks with the town of Newberry about kind of their side of things or? It that? Yeah, that's that's one of the conversations we're going to be going to next. I want we wanted to have a little bit of an internal conversation uh, amongst the I wanted to flag this issue for the mayor, you know, coming in and because um, again, this is relatively recent guidance that we even got from the Commonwealth. Um, and so um, with uh, a couple of, you know, the planning board members we've talked to about well, already the chair and the vice chair who've been there uh, for some time and, you know, have a lot of background with this, uh, these sort of issues, um, talk with some of the counselors about, you know, these, these sort of issues as they might, um, we might be facing, you know, adjustments that we might need to do or our ability to apply for state grants might be limited if we're not able to achieve what the state is, you know, is, is saying as a guide, guide in here. Um, so, uh, yeah, I, I, you know, again, I'm happy to answer any other questions, but um, um that's, I guess, as much background as I have at the moment. That's great. Thank you. Sure. Thank you um, for all of that. Um, so, Robert, um, Bob, yes. uh, very, very quickly, top line, um, just give us um, um, your other, uh, other ideas for affordable housing sites. <clears throat> One of the things I first did is I reviewed the Merrimack Valley Planning Commission report in 2017. It, it encouraged affordable housing development in the city. They also wanted to inventory public land for affordable housing and to partner with nonprofits and private companies to provide affordable housing. So I picked three sites. One is the Morrill House on High Street, which is a dilapidated Federalist, which could be partnered with the Historic Commission. Um, we could get CPA funds between the two of us to get that started, turn it over to a developer if the owner decides they wanna sell. But that's a project that needs to be saved. Um, the second one is the housing for aged men up at 360 High Street, 361, which has all kinds of land with it. It's a private organization. Um, it's the, well, the right-hand side of it is adjacent to this, the city of Newburyport's public housing. Need to approach them to see if they would be willing to provide affordable housing on the right side of their property. And I think that's a doable project. So um, the third project I had in mind was the Mercer project on Merrimack Street. That's a commercially zoned building in a residential neighborhood. Um, we take that building is underutilized. Uh, they tried several years ago to come to the city to use the parking lot for apartment 
houses and market rate housing didn't work. So now I think it could be done for affordable housing. So you could take that whole project, put it it's on the waterfront, do say 50% affordable, 50% market rate and make it a 50-50 deal and put about 150 units of each in it and do it. It's on the bus line, it's ready to go. So the, the, uh, the federal money that's available right now is coming down the pike that $650 million for affordable housing for elderly and veterans. And if we could partner with some of that money, not we, but the developer, we could use it to take a big project like this and make it work. And that's the three projects I think are identifiable that are viable and down the road a piece, something could happen. Thank you, Andy, for the pictures of these. Uh, sure, yeah. I, I, one thing I could add, if I could, I, I would uh, strongly suggest, and I, I think I've mentioned this, Bob and I spoke the other day about uh, some of these possibilities he had mentioned. Um, this is, you know, obviously the assumption here is we're working with the private sector or the nonprofit sector in some ways, as opposed to city property like the Brown School. Um, mm -hmm. and, and there's potential there. One of the things I think is extremely important from experience here, obviously, uh, it should go without saying, is, is reaching out to the ward counselors and coordinating with them. Um, so that there's early coordination on things rather than, um, you know, running into problems later on or disputes over, you know, what the parameters are, what's reasonable for butters and, and so Absolutely. forth. Absolutely. Absolutely correct. Reaching out, that's your job. But I think my job is to identify them and figure out if there's a possibility of them doing something and then go from there. Geez, Bob, why do we need a housing production plan? We have you. <laughs> <laughs> well, I used to do. <laughs> And it's, it's tricky. It's not. It's not that easy. And, and it, it's identifying them and then talking to these people and figuring out. It takes several years to do an affordable housing project. It takes years. Uh, I was working on one in Taunton for five years. It still hasn't closed. So it takes time to get it all done. And if they're willing to do something like that, that's ideal for a bigger developer. And there are some big ones out there. Um, I, I would actually, if I could just note relative to the Brown School, I apologize for sort of circling back in the Brown School for a moment, but one thing that I think uh, was brought up that might be relevant is um, the, uh, during uh, Mayor Holiday's administration towards the tail end, um, in, in discussions with Councilor Eigenman, I think, and a few others, there was I, perhaps an assumption that, that it might be best aligned for the city to work with the housing authority on units on the Brown School. And I think that part probably was at least in part at the time with the assumption that NYS would stay at the site. Um, and that there'd be a smaller you know, portion of the site or building to be used by the city and therefore maybe more viable to work with the housing authority that's a, sort of an established entity here that has units. Um, I think the cost of the building are a little bit more substantial than say it could be done you know, at, at that scale, which is part of the reason why we, we have this discussion of the 20 units in the zoning district. But um, it, it might be helpful for the mayor and I, for instance, to hear if the trust members you know, who, who've worked on the affordable housing uh, you know, projects uh, throughout you know, communities and, and in different ways over the years, your thoughts on uh, the pros and cons of say, you know, only working with the housing authority versus look working with nonprofits or developers and, and the way that we did the RFP last time where we just, you know, open to, uh, to developers and nonprofits to see what they can propose and then rank those, you know, my, my sense generally from experience is it's best to have the broadest possible proposals to us and not necessarily assume we're working with only one entity. Um, but I just, you know, it might be helpful for us to hear your thoughts on that too, because uh, it's a potential parameter for disposition down the road. Yeah, well, Andy. I, go ahead, Madeline. Uh, I was going to say that I agree with you that I, I don't see the advantage to limiting it to the housing authority. Um, we have spoken with the housing authority director, um, and you know I, I wasn't clear on their interest or capacity, but you know some housing authorities are starting to do development. Uh, for many years, they really weren't. But you know we do see it, um, so I, I wouldn't rule it out. But I think it is better to open it up. And we know that there are some nonprofits on the North Shore that are very capable and uh, have worked on school conversions. Um, so I I guess I would think that it would be better to have a broader field. Um, I don't see the advantage personally to limiting it to the housing authority. I agree. I would agree. I agree. I agree. Don't limit it. Yeah, no. All right. Well, that's certainly helpful. Thank you. 
And can I, while we're circling back, I just want to make sure we have a discussion on the agenda next time about what Andy raised about the inclusionary zoning units, because I think that is important to look at that. I'm glad that was raised. Yeah. Yeah. And I wanted to say that, um, that thank you, Karen, um, that we have included in that draft strategic plan um, what Bob was talking about, which is, you know, finding ways to um, identify potential development sites and thinking about the best way to move forward on that. Uh, you know, it's sort of a tricky thing being a trust member because when we're out in the community, we're really just speaking as individual residents of Newburyport. We're, we're not authorized to go out and, and represent the trust on our own. If we, if we want to think about potential development sites that are privately owned, you know, perhaps that should be done, as Andy said, first, you know, speaking with the ward counselor and then maybe the planning department, figuring out the best way to proceed, possibly inviting a property owner to meet with the trust. I mean, there's different approaches, but I think we have to be mindful that as trust members, you know, we can't be out in the field making deals. <laughs> so it's, it, it, while it might be tempting, but again, I wanted to say that this is on the agenda. I mean, it's, I'm, I'm sorry, it's included in the strategic plan for our discussion at our next meeting, um, you know, identifying sites, trying to figure out how best to potentially pursue them. And that would be something that would be included in our next housing production plan. Of course, I don't think we want to wait till then, um, but this can be an ongoing discussion of, you know, how to pursue potential development opportunities. That's so well put, Madeline. Thank you. And I think, you know, the, the we're we're really changing from a reactive body to a more proactive body, and really looking for opportunities versus waiting for things to come our way. So I appreciate um, your input, Bob, and 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 Mad Madeline for articulating that so well. Thank you. Okay, um, I want to move us along. Um, we do we have any other updates um, for from the planning director? Uh, no, again, I'm happy to elaborate on anything you might have questions about, but not at the moment. Thank you. Okay, um, as Madeline mentioned earlier, we have um, a new uh, round of uh, emergency rental assistance and also um, moving assistance that will be coming, uh, will be being launched after we brief the Planning and Development Committee. Um, we just wanna, you know, when we get CPC funding to do something, we'd like to report back. So I, we're trying to establish this feedback loop so that everyone knows. And of course the, the city council, they do have constituents, so they will be um, able to address any needs they have in, in, uh, from their own constituents. So if you recall, there are three, three um, categories. One is COVID related um, expense. One is, uh, the second is a temporary um, loss of a job or some temporary situation that will, will um, uh, won't allow you to pay your full rent. And the third is moving into a new apartment um, or house um, that would help with uh, first, last security or broker fee. So um, really exciting, I'm really glad to see that. Thank you all for all your work at the, uh, our, our, our uh, workshop uh, a few months back. So we're, we're ready to go there. Um, quickly, this is just, um, just sir, we, oh, go ahead, Madeline. Um, I wanted to mention um, applying to the CPC. Um, oh, right, right, right. Some yeah. funds coming up. The deadline for applications is February 3rd. All of a sudden, that's really soon. Um, and so I wanted to propose um, two uh, requests for funds. And these are things that we've touched on in the past. One would be to request $30,000 uh, to cover the cost for um, finding a new consultant to help us update our housing production plan. The housing production plan that we have right now doesn't expire, I think, until 2023. But we have learned from past experience that it takes a while to put out an RFP to identify a new consultant and to you know, get them under contract. 
So I don't, and you know, of course the funding has to be approved by the CPC and then the city council. So it takes a while for all these steps to, to go through. So I don't see any reason to delay. Um, and I don't think that's too controversial. We've done this twice before. We can do it again, we know how to do it. Uh, the second uh, thing I would propose um, is $200,000 application to the CPC um, for uh, setting aside funds for new housing, affordable housing development. So we've done this in the past as well, where we haven't identified the site, but we've made a case that um, we know that if a developer is seeking state funds to um, affordable housing tax credits, uh, state subordinate funds, uh, they're going to be competing with other developers around the state and the city has to have a local match of some sort um, to help them compete for those funds. So it's, it's setting aside money um, that the trust would manage um, to support the affordable housing development. And that could be for the Brown School, but I, I would recommend that we not limit it to the Brown School. Um, so I don't know if anybody wants to talk about this. Um, uh, I had mentioned it to Caitlin today to see whether or not she would be able to work on preparing applications in time for that deadline of February 3rd. Um, but I wanted to make sure we touched on it tonight. I, I think that's very, very, very important. Um, <clears throat> for example, Hamilton just did a um, 18 unit, it, it was a, call it a friendly 40B project, half of which was affordable, half of which was market rate, downtown Hamilton. And the city of um, Hamilton gave the developer $550,000 towards the 50% affordability of that project. They changed it from 25 to 50. They took the extra money and they did it. Its completion is in the spring of 2022. It's almost done. And it is a perfect sized small project, but takes CPA funds in conjunction. So yes, Madeline, that's a very important point. We can do that every year and add to that pool. And the other thing is we don't have a representative on that commission that, that, that decides all this spending. Is that correct? Do we? That's correct. But 25% of it goes to affordable housing. 10%. 10%. Just 10%. Which it was 25. It yeah. could be, but they, they have to set aside 10% for affordable housing. Okay. Um, that's the minimum. If you do a project like the Morrill House where you add you take the historical aspects of the building and you take the affordableness of the building and you put those two together, you can get some serious money out of the CPA funds to help get that to work. Well, I wanna concur, Bob, I agree it's important. And Madeline, I think those are, are great suggestions and I would ask that you make a motion that we, uh, uh, you know, yeah. make a, <laughs> that we apply for that because I, I would support that. Go ahead, make a motion. <laughs> okay, I, I move that we um, submit applications uh, to the CPC for the February 3rd, February 3rd deadline. Uh, one application requesting $30,000 to um, support the um, recruitment and hiring of a consultant to help us with our housing production plan. And secondly, $200,000 uh, to be earmarked for affordable housing development. I, I second that motion. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any nays? Motion passed. Thank you, Madeline. Thank, Thank you. you Madeline. Thank you, Madeline. That's great. <laughs> Um, before we hit, we, uh, Madeline and uh, Karen and I have to vote on um, minutes from, can we, what were the, um, the meeting dates? Most of you were not here, but we were, but we were here. So um, we, um, if we can just do it as a yeah. group, just name the dates and we'll go ahead and. Okay. Could we just say that we, uh, I make a motion to approve. The Wait, I can tell you. Yeah. Oh, good. <laughs> May and June. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, See, we need Caitlin. <laughs> no. Um, 
I'm sorry. Hold on, guys. Okay. Um, a motion to approve the minutes from May 6th, 2021, June 17th, 2021. And that's all I have here, are the two, the two. Were there three? No, two. Okay, for those two dates. I think we hadn't had quorums, as I recall, to actually approve those. That's why we were going backwards. You know, yes. we've looked one since then. But yeah. Right, right. I'll second that motion. Okay, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, <laughs> great. Thank you very much. Um, our next meeting date is, uh, we're proposing March 3rd at six o'clock. Um, so I won't be able to make that, but you can go ahead without me. I'm kind of not going to be around the month of March. Okay. How is everyone else? Is that working for everyone else? For me. Good. Yep. Good. Okay, good. Well, we'll we'll check back to make sure we have a quorum for that day. Sorry, Karen, that you won't be able to to join us. Um, anything else for the good of the order? I just have a. Um, I just want to interject that the YWCA is doing a homeless count in February. If anyone's interested, I believe it's February twenty third. If you're interested, contact me, and um, we usually the the YW coordinates. Um, the, the count and talking with the police departments, uh, the nonprofits in town that um, deal with the homeless, um, the schools and things like that. And um, we have in the past also, also walked um, to certain sections of the city. Um, and it's usually, it has been before dark um, because it's just easier <laughs> and safer to be out at that time, so. Um, if anyone's interested, just let me know. Thank you. Thank you. I know homeless, it's homeless census season. I had forgotten about ours. Yeah, it's a little Thank later. You. Usually it's in January, but um, it's going to be more, uh, February. Great. Thank you, Mio. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? I'll just say thank you for a very productive meeting. I think our new co-chairs are doing a wonderful job and Mayor, it's wonderful to have you here and our new members and it's all very hopeful. Yeah. Oh, great. Thanks, okay. Thanks, Thank uh, motion to adjourn at 716. Mm -hmm. So moved. All right. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right. Good night. Enjoy your Good dinner. Night. Thank you. Good night, everybody. Good night.